The Lord be with you. Let's look at the announcements first of all. The service folder that has the picture of our Lord being tempted by Satan. That's the uh, gospel reading today. We'll say more about that in the sermon, obviously. Uh, open the service folder and you'll see the prayer of the church. First of all, recognize all those names that are printed there and include them in your prayers this week. And then we have some additions. Uh, last night we were made aware that uh, Don Zimmersheed will have surgery uh, the next week, and so we'll include him in our prayers. Also, we heard that um, Aaron McLean's grandfather, H.J. Swede Swenson, uh, passed away this last week, went to his heavenly home, so we'll include that family in our prayers for comfort and peace that's in Jesus. And we'll also include for that same comfort and peace to the family of Bob and Margaret Henning, uh, this, these are relatives of Wilma Williams, Barbara Peck, and Betty Harms. Uh, their son, Eddie Henning, had a stroke and um, has passed away and has gone to his heavenly home. So we'll pray God's uh, peace and comfort to those fam that family as well. Also, I want to point out, it was made known to me this morning that uh, it's been encouraged for the Christian church to pray for all Christians who are persecuted uh, for the sake of the faith. And we've included a little announcement in our service folder right after the prayer of the church, uh, encouraging you uh, day by day to pray for the Christians who are suffering so horribly. The most recent uh, tragedy was when 21 Christian men uh, were, were slaughtered because they were Christians, and that was done in Libya. So let's be mindful of our brothers and sisters in Christ who are suffering so horribly for the sake of Christ and pray that they would be strengthened in their faith, even as we are strengthened in ours. Right below that is again an announcement to encourage you to pray for those in our congregation who are homebound, elderly. Um, I want you to be, also be mindful of uh, this coming Saturday. There's a particular announcement related to this, and you'll find it in the service folder. This coming Saturday will be the 100th birthday for Elsie for Pearl Tenney. And uh, she would love, I know she would love to uh, either see you or to receive a card from you. Uh, she's, she's still uh, very much alert and aware of uh, the congregation. She always uh, asks me questions about people in the congregation in particular. So if, as you have opportunity, if you could sometime during the week uh, go over and see Elsie Pearl and wish her a happy birthday or at least maybe send her a card and uh, bless her in that way. This coming Wednesday, we continue with our uh, Lenten services, and we're going to pray. That's what our Lord has given us to do in part during the season of Lent. We have the joy of adding a service, and so Wednesday at 7 o'clock, we will pray. And the theme for Lent will be the churches in Revelation, and how God's addressing those churches also is an address to the church today. Uh, so come and join us for that as we journey through the season of Lent. There wasn't anyone who signed up for a meal uh, before the service this week. And so, as it is, there will be no meal before the service. So eat in your own home, but then come and feed off of the, the uh, bread that is our Lord Jesus Christ and His Word. That'll be at 7 o'clock this coming Wednesday. Um, let's see... Uh, the uh, uh, mission project, the quarterly mission project, the mission team determined that today uh, there would also be a door offering. So if the Lord would lead you to do that as you uh, leave the church today, if you'd like to contribute in the door offering for the uh, Madagascar mission project, that would be a, a wonderful blessing as well. Any other announcements we need to make today? Okay. Uh, we are in the first Sunday of Lent. And let's begin this morning by singing the uh, first hymn, number 530, No Temple Now, No Gift of Christ. <laughs>
Turn to the service folder where we find the words to confess our sin and hear our Lord's forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I will go to the altar of God. God our help is in the name of the Lord. God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death, of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. God, be merciful to you and strengthen your faith. Do you believe that the forgiveness I speak is not my forgiveness, but God's? Yes. Let it be done for you as you believe. In the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God and my trust. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will rescue him and honor him. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O Lord God, you led your ancient people through the wilderness and brought them to the promised land. Guide the people of your church that following our Savior, we may walk through the wilderness of this world toward the glory of the world to come. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading that's appointed for the first Sunday in Lent is taken from the third chapter of Genesis. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. 
He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all the living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. This is the word of the Lord. He will command his angels concerning you. On their hands they will bear you up. The epistle reading is from 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time, I listen to you, and in a day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, by great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. <coughs> this is the word of the Lord. Be to God. We rise and speak together the verse for Lent. <laughs> These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fourth chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting forty days and forty nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. This is the gospel of the Lord. 
Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. The president doesn't have to declare that there is a war. There already is a war. There has always been a war, that is, 
since our first parents fell in sin. The battle is on still to this day, and yet strangely enough, the victory has been won. Bizarre, isn't it? It's not how wars work, but this is our life. This is our life in the church. This is our life as Christians. This hymn that we just sang is often referred to as the Battle Hymn of the Reformation. I don't think really that Luther intended that it as that necessarily, but it has become that, and it's put in our hymnal in a section that's entitled the Church Militant, the Church that's fighting. We talked about that a little bit in the announcements today when I mentioned that there are so many Christians throughout the world who are dying, being killed, being slaughtered, just because they're Christian. And the reason for that is the world is full of devils. The devil, Satan himself, the leader of all the devils, is real. We have this word of God before us today, this gospel reading today, that tells us about this very real Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We believe that. That's our faith. And he goes out into the wilderness to do battle with a very real Satan, the leader of all that's evil. Point being, if we believe that Jesus is real, that he is the Son of God in the flesh, we need to also believe that the devil is real, even to this very day. And the primary task of the devil is to get you to stop believing in Jesus. He does that by turning you away from God's Word. He does that by turning God's Word, twisting God's Word, misquoting God's Word. He does that by convincing you that you can be your own God, maker of your own destiny, and so you don't need God. The example of that is given to us in the Gospel reading today. In this first Sunday in Lent, we remember what we heard, for instance, from Ash Wednesday, that we come into a time of the church here when we especially reflect upon the Christian life. The Christian life consists, as our Lord gives it to us, we heard from Matthew chapter 6 on Ash Wednesday, the Christian life consists, at least in part, but a very important part, in fasting. That is, that we have opportunity to not gorge ourselves constantly on the world and its ways. That we find times to reject. That we find opportunities that we don't get caught up in greed, in covetousness and in the ways of the world, but rather in the things of God. So fasting is part of the Christian life. Joined with that, closely joined with that, is prayer. Isn't it true that we need to be encouraged constantly to pray? The scripture bids us to pray without ceasing. How good are we at that? And so we need to constantly be reminded to talk to our Father who loves us, our Father who has rescued us from sin and death, to bring our petitions, our, our, our needs before him, not only for ourselves, but for the sake of others. And again, we are encouraged to do that. I, every Sunday, I try to start with pointing us to the prayer of the church, to those people who are in need of our prayers day by day by day, and others throughout the world who also are in need of the prayers that we can bring on their behalf to our loving Heavenly Father. And finally, we are called as Christians, according to Matthew 6, to see to the needs of those who are in need. That is, to give alms, to reach out to those who are poor, and in need of love 
the love that God can give, especially and foremost through our Savior Jesus in the forgiveness of sins, but also as God has blessed us materially, that we have the opportunity to reach out to people materially. And that's one of the reasons why we're especially emphasizing these quarterly mission projects, that we have the, that opportunity constantly before our face to reach out to those who are in need of the love of God our Father. Jesus gives us an example, especially of fasting and praying in the Gospel reading. And it happens right after his baptism. And that's why St. Matthew writes, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit, up from the Jordan Valley, up from the waters where he was baptized, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, who was very real. Jesus is baptized. We celebrated that fact the first Sunday of Epiphany. He's baptized not to have sins washed away as we are baptized, as we are in need of, but rather to have sins washed on to him. In that baptism, Jesus takes on the sins of the world, and he is on that journey as we journey with him in this season of Lent. He is on that journey to the cross, where God the Father and Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit have determined that the sins of the world would be answered for in death. In the death of the Son of God, the perfect sinless Son of God who takes our sins away from us. And by that justice, the righteousness, the forgiveness, the mercy of God is given to us in his shed blood. There is no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. And the shedding of blood takes place by the Son of God on the cross for our salvation. So Jesus comes up out of the water and he goes into the wilderness and, and the gospel writers make us aware that he's in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. Now that number is significant, isn't it? 40 is used constantly throughout the scripture. And, and 40 and wilderness go together. And it makes us mindful then of God's people, Israel. When they were delivered from their slavery in Egypt, and they were brought through the waters of the Red Sea miraculously by God who was there with them, present with them. And they were brought into the wilderness in order to journey to the land that God had promised them. A land that would sustain them, would provide for them, would give them great benefit that God was giving to them. And they came out into the wilderness on that journey. And because of their rebellion, because they all too often gave in to the words of Satan, to the devil, and to their own sinful flesh. They were stuck in that wilderness for 40 years until God allowed them to enter into the promised land. The people of Israel were God's chosen people. God had made his covenant with Abraham that he would have for himself a particular people. And from that Lineage from Abraham's lineage would come eventually a savior for the entire world, not just for Israel, but for everyone. And Israel itself was to be a light to the rest of the nations. All of those around Israel, God's people, should be able to look at Israel and say, there is the true God. There is the God that we need to listen to. There is the God that we need to follow. But sadly, because of the devil's work and because of the sinful flesh of God's people, there was much rebellion and rejection of God's word. In the wilderness, the people of God grumbled against God, even as he provided for them as they journeyed through the wilderness. In the wilderness, God's people built for themselves an alternate God, a golden calf, who they believed would finally get them to the promised land. And they suffered, many of them suffered to the point of death in their rejection of God. But God had mercy. Because of his love, he had mercy on most of them. And they journeyed then finally to the Jordan River and crossed the Jordan River into the Promised Land after those 40 years. The reason why I'm telling you all of this is because Jesus now becomes Israel, reduced to one person. Jesus goes out into the wilderness after coming through the Jordan River. And now all of those who would believe 
would believe that the promise is fulfilled. The promise of salvation that was given to Israel of old is fulfilled in this Israel, in Jesus himself. And all who would look to Jesus for salvation would find rescue from sin, death, and the devil. You see, that's what salvation is, isn't it? St. Paul tells us in the epistle reading, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day in which we need to listen again to our God, that we need to live lives of repentance for our own sin, for our own rejection of our God and the rejection of his word, that we need to receive from our God what Jesus has come to give, that is, the forgiveness of sins. So Jesus himself goes out into the wilderness, and he fasts for 40 days and 40 nights. <coughs> The text doesn't say it, but I think rightly, because this is who Jesus is, we can imply that Jesus must have been out there praying. He knew that his journey was to the cross. He knew that he would suffer horribly and die for the sins of the world. He knew that he would endure the wrath of God for all of our sins. And even as Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane that the cup would pass from him, Jesus must have been in the wilderness praying in such a way and praying for all of those who believed in him and would believe in him, and that includes you. He fasted, and we can say he prayed 40 days and 40 nights. And then Matthew writes a bit of an understatement, I think. You would imagine what it would be like after 40 days and 40 nights without food. He was hungry. And the tempter came. The devil came and said to him, as the devil would do, If you are the Son of God, prove yourself. Show us that you're the Son of God. Let's see something spectacular. Now, the devil knows who this is. You'll recall later on in the Gospel readings when Jesus, when Jesus would go about casting out demons, driving out devils from those who were possessed. Often, those demons would recognize Jesus. They would say something like, I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. The devil himself knows who Jesus is. But what he's trying to do in these temptations is to deter Jesus from where he's headed. He's trying to get Jesus to do something that would convince people otherwise that Jesus <laughs> might be the Son of God that is not the cross. Do something spectacular, Jesus, and people will believe in you. It's kind of the mindset of Peter on Transfiguration Sunday. Peter sees Jesus transfigured in all of, in, not in all of his glory, but he sees Jesus in glory, and he says, let's build three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Peter's mindset probably was something like, well, if, if this is so spectacular, imagine if everybody could see this, everyone would believe in you. But you see, that's not what Jesus has given for the sake of faith. For those of us who would truly believe in the Savior of the world, the one who was sacrificed for us for the forgiveness of sins, this is where we must look. The Apostle Paul reminds us constantly. He does, for instance, in 1 Corinthians. We preach Christ crucified. To be sure, we know that he lives. We know the end of the story. We know that he has risen from the dead. But it's his crucifixion that is for us salvation as he gives to us the forgiveness of sins. When we come and kneel in just a few moments and we receive the body and blood of Jesus, again, St. Paul reminds us, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. There it is. That's the focus. The devil would not have us believe it. Let's see something spectacular. Jesus, you're hungry. Take these stones and turn them into bread. If God really loves you, if you are the Son of God, make it happen. But what does Jesus do? He turns to the true bread of life. His words, words that come from Deuteronomy chapter 8. And they're words for us to hang on to. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word 
that comes from the mouth of God. That's our true life. We need bread. We need sustenance for our bodies. God gives us that too in answer to our petition. Give us this day our daily bread. But even more than that, we need the word of God. And all of it. Jesus says every word that comes from the mouth of God. And what we believe, it's, it's that word of God that begins in Genesis, in the beginning. And that ends in Revelation, Amen. Every word in between is for us life. And we need to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest all of this word. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. If we would have faith to cling to our Savior Jesus, to truly feed off of him and his salvation, we need to open our ears and receive that word that is life, especially in the forgiveness of our sins. The devil takes him to the holy city and tempts him again. He sets him on the pinnacle of the temple and he says to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. And then the devil does something that we need to be mindful of. The devil knows God's word. The devil speaks God's word. The lesson for us is, just because someone is talking about Jesus, doesn't mean they know what they're talking about when it comes to Jesus. The devil is deceptive. He would lead us away from our Savior Jesus and from the forgiveness of sins. The devil tries to use God's word against the word made flesh. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, because in Psalm 91 it says, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. In other words, God will rescue you. You're not going to get any owies, Jesus. That's not for you in this life. Well, guess what? Here's the biggest owie there ever was. The suffering and death of our Lord Jesus. That's His goal. That's His journey. Again, it's the cross that is our focus. The devil is trying to say to Jesus, if God the Father really loves you, you're not going to suffer and die. Don't go on that road. But that's exactly the road that Jesus is headed down. The devil is a liar. He is a deceiver. He would even use God's word to turn us away from our Savior Jesus, which is why we need to know all that God would say to us, every word that comes from the mouth of God. Imagine, too, the spectacle. Jesus is on the pinnacle of the temple. This happened in real time. This really happened. And people in Jerusalem are constantly gathered around the temple. Jesus casts himself off the temple. His body is falling down to the ground. And here comes the angels to scoop him up. People would see that. And they'd say, oh, now I know this is the Son of God. But that's not what Jesus has given. Here is where he is given to be recognized as the Son of God. Here is where he is glorified for the sake of the world. Jesus said to him, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. How often do we put the Lord God to the test? If you really loved me, God, why would I suffer so? If you really loved me, God, why would there be a continual death that takes place in the world? If you loved me, God, is the test that we constantly bring before our God. And so we need to be focused again upon where love is given, especially to those who are sinners, and that's us. Love that's given to us in the forgiveness of sins by the crucified Savior. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Now here, the devil shows himself to be completely delusional. He prowls around like a roaring lion in the world, seeking whom he may devour. The war is on still for us today. But the world does not belong to the devil. The world is the Lord God's who created it, the heavens and the earth. The world belongs to Jesus. And here the devil shows himself to be the greatest liar that he is. Just fall down and worship me. Listen to my words, Jesus. But Jesus won't have it. He says what we constantly need to say. Be gone, Satan. 
For it is written, Deuteronomy chapter 6, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. How often does the devil come to us for worship? He did it to our first parents. He convinced them to turn away from all of the glory that God had given to them as, as, the, as the crown of his creation. God had created the heavens and the earth in all of its beauty, in all of its joy, without sin and without death for our first parents. He simply said to them, one commandment, one piece, one little sentence in, in, in the Bible would have been a very small Bible, wouldn't it? Do not eat from the tree in the middle of the garden. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And the devil comes along as the liar he is and says, you will not die. And they bought it. They worshipped the devil rather than continuing to worship the true God and serve him. And so they fell, and all of us fell as a result. All of us are cursed with that death that circles and encompasses the whole world and everyone in it. The whole creation, in Romans chapter 8, it says the whole creation groans for redemption, being bought back from the destiny of failure, of pain and suffering and death. And so do we. We also groan in our lives, but not without hope. Rather, we open our ears our mouths, our hearts, and our minds to a God who loves us, a God who sent his Son, our Savior Jesus, into our flesh to rescue us from sin and from death. We're in a battle, folks. The battle still goes on today, and yet we know that by the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ and his resurrection from the dead, the victory has already been won, but the battle continues on. The world, the devil, and even our own flesh hates us and would destroy us. So we need to constantly return, repent, cling to our Savior Jesus, who is for us forgiveness and life and finally eternal salvation. We're in a war, and we need to be in that fight. We need to know that Christ is in us and with us constantly to do battle for us as he forgives our sins and strengthens us in the faith. We need to know that even if we should die, even if those who hate us would put us to death like so many Christians throughout the world today, that we live. The devil will not have the final say, neither will death. But our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ always has the final say for those who cling to him. And that means life. Life lived here in peace, in confidence, and in the joy that our Lord gives to us in his salvation. And life lived forever in the place where Jesus has prepared for us new heavens and new earth, a new Eden where there is no more sin or suffering or death. Your brothers and sisters in Christ, don't shy away from the battle but grab hold of your weapons with your right and your left hands. And the weapons are God's word and righteousness. The weapons are Jesus himself. Cling to your Savior Jesus. Always return to your Savior Jesus. Live your lives in repentance and faith. Pray fast and give alms as the children of God that he has called you to be. And that, in Jesus' name, amen. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Jesus Christ, your Savior. Amen. Let us rise and confess our faith in the triune God of our salvation. We'll use the words of the church, the Apostles' Creed. You can find that easily in the back of the hymnal. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. 
ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Almighty God, we give you thanks that immediately after his baptism, your Son, our Savior Jesus, continued his work of salvation by being tempted in the wilderness by the devil. We give great thanks that in him we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet remained without sin to be the sacrifice for us. Guard us, we pray, from the temptation of believing that we are left to our own strength to resist the devil, the world, and our own sinful flesh. Rather rejoicing that you tempt no one, guard and keep us so that these enemies may not deceive us or mislead us into false belief, despair, and other great shame and vice. Preserve us, O Lord, in repentance and faith, so that though we be assailed by temptations in Christ Jesus, we overcome because Christ Jesus has overcome for us and won the victory and given it to us. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we praise your name for your faithfulness to your beloved Son as you sent angels to minister him, to him in the wilderness, rejoicing that you have made us your beloved children in Christ by water and the word. We pray that you would send every blessing upon us to support this body and life according to your gracious will where we are tempted to anxiety because we lack necessities and doubt your promises, forgive us those doubts and strengthen us in true faith so that we might always look to you for every good gift that comes from above. Lord, in your mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, we give thanks that in your incarnation the time was fulfilled for the kingdom of God to be at hand and that you confirmed this proclamation by healing many of their diseases and afflictions. We commend to you all those in need of healing and mercy. We'll na we name these before you, Richard, Elsie Pearl, Erna, Denise, Katie Beth, Coraline, Sue, Laura, Vernon, Paul, Hunter, Cecil, Wilbert, Alvin, Eldine, Kay, David, Debbie, Pastor Joseph, Don, and we also pray, pray for Gina and any others whom we might know. Deliver them, O Lord God, according to your gracious will. In the meantime, preserve them from the temptations of bitterness and despair and make use of these troubles in their lives to strengthen their faith and joy in Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for your mercy given to Adam and to Eve and to all the saints who have gone before us in the faith of Jesus. We pray that you would sustain us in that same faith in the faith of the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, so that with all your saints we may stand before your throne in everlasting joy. To that end, O Lord, we pray your peace and comfort to the family of H.J. Swenson and also to the family of Bob and Margaret Henning, that you would grant them such a peace that comes only from Jesus in his resurrection to life ever, to, for us to the life everlasting that he has prepared for us. We pray that you would be with all of us, especially in those times in which death seems near, so that we might rejoice in the salvation that Jesus has given us to the resurrection of the dead and life everlasting. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Blessed Lord Jesus, we give you thanks that the kingdom of God remains as near to us as your presence here today in your word and with your holy sacraments. Bless the word that is proclaimed in your holy church this day faithfully sending your Holy Spirit to work repentance and faith in all. Bless all who partake of the Holy Communion this day. Preserve them from doubts in your presence or temptations to misuse this supper. Give to them repentant hearts that they might receive your body and your blood for the forgiveness of their sins and rejoice in the common confession of your saving word with those around them at your altar. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we are mindful of the suffering that comes to Christians as we take up the cross and follow you. We hear often now about those brothers and sisters in Christ throughout the world 
who are truly dying for the sake of their faith in Jesus. We pray for all of those who are under persecution to the point of death, that you would strengthen them in their faith, that in their dying minutes that they would confess faith in Jesus so that others might hear and believe in the one who has come to rescue from sin and death. In the midst of all of this, Lord, help us to love our enemies so that they might hear of Jesus the Savior and they too might repent and live here in Jesus and forever with Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you, and in fervent love toward one another, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.